Quicker. The President, uh, please be seated. The court is now in session. During today's sessions, the chamber continues to hear the testimony of civil party Lai Boni. The chamber wishes to also inform the co-lawyers for the civil parties and Mrs. Lai Boni that uh, when putting questions and responding to the questions, uh, make sure you observe some pause so that uh, the interpreters could render the message fully because yesterday you were rather fast. Court Grepshe is now instructed to report on the attendance of the parties to the proceedings today. Sai Kolbati Good morning, Mr. President. All parties to the proceedings are present except uh, Mr. Ian Sari, who is absent due to his health reason. According to document E-237, the accused uh, person has waived his right to the testimony of uh, the civil party and another Reserve Witness TCW 362. Mr. Arthur Vakan is absent because of his personal commitment. TCW 362 is ready in the waiting room and awaits a moment where the witness will be asked to take an oath. According to the witness' best recollection and knowledge, the witness has nothing or has no related uh, relation or blood relation to any of the parties to the proceedings, including the accused persons. This witness will be assisted uh, by ca uh, jury counsel, Mr. Lum Bunheng. The President, uh, thank you. We would like to hand over to the lawyers for the civil parties to proceed. Council Mot Savanari. Thank you, Mr. President, Your Honours, and very good morning to you, Madam Civil Party. Yesterday we left off when you were evacuated to Gondal and Badambong. Today I would like to continue putting a few more questions concerning this evacuation. Could you please be more precise on when exactly you were transferred from Gondal? A response. Very good morning, Your Honours. At that time, I do not recollect the exact date, but it is most likely in May. The rain started to fall heavily already. It was the farming season, and I was transplanting the rice when I was asked to pack my luggage so that I could be transferred to Badambong. Question. I will refer to the same question as I did yesterday, and with Mr. President's leave, I want the document to be put up on the screen. Document in Khmer ERN 00337-3249. English ERN 0037 9159 and French ERN 00 42251 through 52. 
here, you stated before the investigating judges that you were taken by an ox cart uh, to the river bank be before you boarded uh, a boat uh, to Badambong. And then you were transported by the Chinese military truck. My next question is, when you reached the river bank, uh, how many boats did you see coming to pick up the people? Response. Through the ox cart, uh, indeed when I reached uh, the river banks, I saw three ships, big vessels, the ship that could accommodate a few hundred people, and we were asked to load our luggage onto the ships immediately because we had to rush uh, to make sure we got to Kampong Chenang before the sun set. Question. Can we ask you please uh, how many people were boarding each ship at that time? Response. Uh, there were not a lot of people. It was not very crowded because people uh, could uh, lie down if they wished. Question. How many people approximately were there on the board of uh, the dock of the ship that you're boarding? Response. There were less than a hundred people altogether. Question. Were all the evacuees uh, from Sakandal district or from elsewhere? Response. All the evacuees uh, were from Sakandal district, indeed from different communes and villages. Question. You just mentioned that when you were on board the ship, uh, you saw the Khmer Rouge soldiers who were armed and who uh, pushed you onto the ship. Uh, so do you know who, where these soldiers were from? Response. I do not know where these soldiers were from. But I know that they were from the zone. Question. I would like uh, to go back to your record of interview on e uh, an in Khmer 00-37-3250. English ERNs zero zero three seven nine one sixty, French ERNs zero zero four two twenty four fifty two. In that portion, you say that you were sent uh, to Wat Koh Chum in Po Sat, and that the ox carts were seen poised to transport the people to other locations. My question is, who prepared uh, the ox carts to receive the people? Response. I have no idea who made uh, all these arrangements, 
But after asking a few questions uh, to other villagers, I learned that the Oscars were from different cooperatives from Sector 22 and Sector 23, for example. I asked them where the Oscars could have been from. Some would say they were from Cần Dieng location, and they asked us where we would like to go or whether we would like to go to Cần Dieng or not, and I said I had no idea. Question. When the Khmer Rouge countries in Sakandal asked you to leave the area, you were told that you would be transferred to Badambong where food uh, was uh, plentiful. It, when you were transferred to Posat, uh, did the Khmer Rouge keep their words uh, by transferring you all the way to Badambong as they promised? Response. Indeed, they did not honor their promise. I believe that uh, they only used that as a pretext to make sure we could be moved from the location more immediately. And uh, I don't believe that they care so much about failing to honor their promise. Question. At the cooperative at Posat province, did you have enough food or was the food plentiful as they said? Response. During the Khmer Rouge regime, from the beginning when I left Phnom Penh, Whenever the harvest, rather, whenever the trans, uh, rice trans, transplant season came, it was the most uh, difficult time concerning food. Uh, so we did not have food uh, to eat, in particular during the rainy, uh, the, the farming season. But I could manage to bring along some uh, food staff so that we could survive on them. Question. What was your impression concerning the livelihood of the evacuees and other people? Did you notice that these people were given enough food to eat? Response. At the Kochum Cooperative, I only learned about people in my neighboring village and uh, the people in that village had uh, to clear the bamboo tree so that they could uh, make a village and uh, the evacuees in uh, this uh, village uh, all died uh, sometimes in the whole family, none last member of the family survived because of the ordeal. Question, I th will conclude uh, this point uh, by asking you this question. When the evacuees uh, were transported or transferred to the location, how were they treated? Response. At that time, there was no special treatment. We were made uh, to form groups eating communally like four cans of rice uh, for a few people, and uh, people would be tasked uh, with uh, working at different locations. But when people fell ill, we were not offered uh, any medicine, and the food itself was um, short.
question. This is the last uh, question to you, please. Um, have you observed or what was your observation concerning the transfer of the people from Phnom Penh to Bakan district in Posad? Do you believe that such a policy was friendly enough to the people who were evacuated? Response, I personally feel that if they were to treat us well, to bring us all the food supplies they wanted, I do not feel there would be any short supplies of food because uh, there was plenty of food available. However, the Phnom Penh dwellers who were then the evacuees were destined for being tempered mainly and they did not care whether we died or not. They just wanted uh, to make sure we got tempered. Council. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Civil Party, for your responses to my question, and I thank you, the bencher, for this opportunity to put all those questions to the Civil Party. Next, I would like to cede the floor to my colleague, uh, Mrs. Uh, Elizabeth Simonofo, the President, uh, Council Simonofo. You may now proceed. Good morning, Mr. President. Uh, good morning, Your Honors. Good morning to all of you. Good morning, uh, witness. I'm going to put to you a few questions now. I would like to return a bit to the first uh, transfer, the first uh, evacuation of people uh, that uh, you were involved in. And you told us you described uh, your journey to us and how long, basically, including the stops along the way, how long did this first journey last? Response. I cannot recollect this precisely, but I left on the 17th of April, and after a few stops, uh, we reached Kandal district by um, late, rather by uh, by the end of the Khmer New Year. So I can say it took us approximately one month for the trip. Thank you. <clears throat> you described uh, what happened along the road, in particular in regard to your family. So among the people, who, what would happen to those who could not keep up uh, with the journey, who could not uh, uh, continue? Response. For people who could not continue their journey, like the people who had just left uh, the hospital, they would be pushed uh, by a wheeled uh, hospital bed, or they would be carried uh, in stretcher or hammocks. And somebody who were seriously ill would also be carried uh, on somebody's back uh, while walking. Did uh, people remain on the wayside? Response. Yes, uh, there were women who were giving birth 
to the babies, and we could hear them crying out loud in pain when they were about to give birth uh, to the babies, and we would be crying, asking for any midwives uh, who would uh, be able to help uh, give birth uh, to the child. Then uh, later on, we could find an, a senior midwife who could uh, like uh, help uh, the woman, the women delivering the babies. I am now going to turn to the place where you stopped for a few months called Ban Sheng Buk. I'm sorry for my pronunciation. You told us that uh, their meetings were organized, which you attended. And during these meetings, were you given information on what was happening in Cambodia and were you given any information on uh, the national policies? Response In An Cheng Le village, I attended livelihood meetings. I also engaged in carrying banana trees. After giving birth to my child for 20 days, I reached that uh, village, and because I fear I would be killed. I had to engage in carrying big, heavy banana trees. I did not have the gut to even tell uh, the people that I had just delivered the, the baby. I had to work and carry heavy loads. However, in the meetings, uh, we were not told uh, anything about the policy or of the Anka rather than teaching us or lecturing us on how to build canal, digging dikes, and how to uh, comply with the uh, plan of the Anka. Thank you. Were you obliged to listen to speeches at times, speeches by political figures? Response. At that time, I did not have an opportunity to listen to any of the speeches. Thank you. You often said to us yesterday, and also uh, you told the investigating judge that you were considered as a member of uh, the new people, and you also spoke to us about the base people. So can you tell us what the differences were between both of these categories in day-to-day -day life, in the way people were being treated uh, in when you were at work, etc.? Response. The old people and the new people were different. The old people had been living in the communities for a very long time. They had their own belongings, property, they had their uh, household utensils. and ready for use, but for the 17th of April people, they were new people and evacuees. They were told by Anka that they would be leaving the city for three days because uh, they had to li we had to leave before the bombs would be dropped on us. So we left with nothing. We were from the worker class family, we never, uh, business people, we never got used to farming, 
chopping small trees to clear way for paddy fields. So we had to make the most of it. For example, we would take the advantage of having our brought along belongings and things to exchange with things that we needed. For example, we would uh, exchange some belongings for knives or uh, other kitchen utensils. And we did not do very well uh, in performing our farming tasks, and we were accused of being uh, not skilled or uh, being passive. And the old people in the base actually got used to the work. They could do things much faster than we did. Uh, for example, when it comes to farming, the old people could take a few hours to finish the whole paddy field when farming, but we had to really spend much more time than that because we did get not get used to doing it. Were the new people respected by the Khmer Rouge just as the base people or was there a difference? response. Indeed, uh, new people were not treated equally as they did to the old people because the old people uh, had already built their themselves, so it is the new people who had to build themselves and be newcomer. Thank you. Yesterday you told us that your daughter was, fell ill during the journey when people were evacuated because uh, she ate corn uh, that was uh, spoiled. And what happened uh, to your daughter? Response. When we reached... Sakandal, my daughter who had been ill for a few days already, she had uh, severe diarrhea and uh, we did not have enough medicine uh, for her treatment. I was asked uh, to pick up some leaves uh, to, for her to treat her illness. And every one member of our family got ill. We got fever and high temperature. And uh, my aunt, who lived in the Sur commune, who paid a visit uh, to us, when she saw this, she would like uh, to take my daughter to live with her so that she could be treated uh, because she believed that when a member of the family is sick uh, and if she allowed to be among the family, uh, then everyone could uh, get infected. Uh, so with that uh, uh, offer, I also agreed uh, to let her go. A few days later, I believed that my daughter would be properly treated or well taken care of, but only to learn that she died when being there. How old was your daughter, madam? Response. She was uh, five years old. She was born by late 1971. In the first place where you lived for a few months, did you see or did you hear about people disappearing or being arrested?
response. I heard about this. Before I were made uh, to live in a private house uh, assigned by the Khmer Rouge, I lived uh, with comrade John with a few families, and I was asked to conceal my identity. I was asked to really keep this secret. I was told to tell people that I was uh, a taxi driver or just food staff vendor. And uh, A lot of people who knew um, one of the family member because he went uh, there on several occasions was reported. And later on, we learned that he disappeared. I don't remember the name of that person because his uh, identity was uh, somehow revealed. Uh, and uh, from that incident, we were told that uh, we had to be prepared. For example, if we had a male member in the family, we had to be ready, for example, packing our luggage. If we were called, then we would be ready to go and leave. Fortunately, none of my family member would disappear after that. When somebody disappeared, were you then given any kind of explanation about the disappearance? Response. I was not told uh, about this. The, 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 we only learned that uh, the person was taken to work at other location. We had no nerve, actually, to or strength to ask uh, people what happened to a person who disappeared. Je vous remercie. Thank you. You were displaced then once again. You were told that you were going to Batambong, and in fact, you went to Bursat. What was the physical condition for the uh, 17th of April people when they were displaced a second time? Response. I myself was sick because during the day of the evacuation, uh, a few days before that, I uh, was transplanting potatoes uh, at my, uh, in my backyard. And at that time, because we had to be evacuated, I had to make use of the potatoes that we planted uh, so that we could eat on the road but uh, the food stuff that we had to eat on the road didn't do any good to us. It was uh, bad to our stomach. Yes, but generally speaking, people who were moved with you, all of these people, were they in good physical shape or not? Uh, what? kind of uh, health status did they have when they were being displaced? Response. Early days during the evacuation, the, our physical and health condition was uh, normal. We still looked good and we could bring along with us some belongings, we could have them exchanged uh, with some um, rice to store for future supply. In Bosat, uh, I could manage uh, to keep some of uh, these uh, rice uh, we could have traded uh, with uh, other people, so we still looked uh, 
reasonably normal. However, when times passed by, we did not have enough food to eat. We ate the food uh, that uh, was uh, very little. We ate uh, food uh, that uh, made us become, you know, the, our body parts become swollen. And we believe at that time we noted that the pigs uh, were even given more food uh, than uh, that they gave to human beings. Thank you. After the second displacement, you came to Kuchum. Madam, can you tell us what happened to your son, Sinarit? Response. I Kachum Cooperative, we were put into different groups, and with the belongings I brought with me, I could have them traded uh, with some sticks and poles so that uh, we could uh, make our makeshift uh, shelter. And um, my mother and brothers and my remaining son still stayed with me, but we had to work uh, very hard. Uh, we did nothing but concentrate on farming. And uh, in the evenings, uh, we would uh, attend meetings, livelihood meetings, and I was criticized uh, for not uh, efficiently perform my task. I was uh, in Phnom Penh before, and I got married with a high-ranking officer, and I did not know how to do this hard work before. And in the cooperative, I had to carry water to feed, uh, to irrigate uh, the plants. And the pond where the water was uh, fixed uh, was far from uh, the location where the plants uh, were grown. So it was so difficult. And I could not uh, manage to follow, to comply with the plan. And for that, I was severely criticized. Madame, je sais que c'est un peu difficile de répondre précisément à certaines de mes questions. It's a little bit difficult to give a precise answer. I quite understand that, but I do need to ask you what happened to your son, Sinari? Response. My son got ill again. He got a diarrhea and noting that uh, there nothing could cure his illness, I asked that he be admitted to Kandiang Hospital where he died. And I returned to the cooperative and only my husband and I survived. Excusez-moi d'insister. Excuse me for dwelling on this. What happened to your younger sister, please? Response. My younger sister also died after she had a kind of symptom that the whole body was swelling and she couldn't survive this ordeal. When you were in this second place, 
Were you under surveillance? Response, yes, I was. I was placed under surveillance every evening, and I could also note that the members of other family also kept uh, disappearing every now and then, and I was also told that I had to keep mum because uh, the wall has the ears. In the second place, did people disappear? Response. At the second location, people disappeared uh, because the husband of my neighbor uh, was taken away and also a group of family members uh, were also taken away and later on it happened to me and my husband. You said that uh, your husband was a London soldier and you explained that after the first population transfer, Jorn told you to hide his uh, profession and helped you hide his profession. Then later, and in particular in the second place, Po Chung, did the Khmer Rouge learn what your husband was doing? Response. When I arrived, Go Chung Cooperative, I did not know why they learned about my identity and that of my husband's. But uh, later on, I noted that uh, the security guards of the security center approached uh, my husband and kicked him repeatedly and asked him where he hid uh, his handgun. Can you tell us what happened to your husband? Response. At that security center, my husband had been accused severely. I am a spouse who was accompanying uh, my husband, uh, I only learned that he was detained uh, in a uh, detention facility where it was a complete darkness, uh, and we were separated uh, forever until the day when my husband was executed. Did you... Were you also arrested yourself because of him? Response. Yes, I was, uh, because uh, my husband uh, was com uh, implicated and accused, uh, then I had to also be brought along with my husband. However, I was not interrogated like my husband was because I uh, only was his spouse. I was allowed to work outside at the cooperatives and ate uh, there, but my husband didn't enjoy this. Uh, he only was uh, given a full ladder of porridge and only a grain of salt for each meal. And when you were arrested as well, did you notice people disappearing or people being executed? Response. 
Uh, could you tell us, uh, please, in which location uh, where uh, disappearance happened? It, uh, please uh, repeat that uh, f portion. You said to us that your husband had been arrested and executed and that you had been arrested as well and led to a center. In this center, did you notice people disappearing or people being executed? Response. The location was the place for execution. At that place, I was pushed into a room, and I was uh, terrified. It was incredible because the plates, uh, the bowls of, uh, that were used for serving rice were used to keep feces, excrement and uh, the stench was horrible and I was there to remain in the prison. I had to place my nose close to a small hole so that I could breathe uh, some oxygen. Then I s then saw a soldier, a very young soldier, underage, uh, armed with a rifle, came coming to ask for Comrade King. He accused uh, Comrade King for stealing a grilled fish. And I had uh, to look at the way this uh, person was treated. I saw the young boy uh, hacked uh, the person's stomach. Uh, his internal organ was uh, coming out and he was stabbed with bayonet uh, and I couldn't cry because I was so terrified that I would end up being killed like that and I had uh, to remain in the vicinity and I had to work every third day of the week and uh, on that Day, uh, those days, then a soldier would be coming to ask for a group of people, for example, a different age uh, group, uh, so that they could be sent to the zone. I did not know what zone was. I was l uh, told that zone uh, is the place where food was plentiful, where we could have some fruit, like oranges because we believed already that in Posad uh, it was plenty of uh, rice and oranges and having heard that people could be taken to the zone I asked that I be allowed to go to the zone because I was hoping that I would be offered uh, enough food to eat later on uh, indeed they did not allow me to go with them and it was fortunate that I did I was not allowed to go with them, otherwise I could have been executed already. So, the soldiers who always brought us uh, to work, uh, the soldiers ended up being the prisoners themselves at a later date, some of them. And uh, when we discussed about the execution, and the guards who turned uh, prisoners say that indeed killing started even in 1975 and by 1977 about approximately indeed a hundred thousand people had already been executed. and uh, people who disappeared and who believed to be sent to the zone were sent to be executed. And the clothes of the people who had been executed would be brought back to uh, the remaining people to use. So 
After that, I learned that indeed the zone was the place where execution took place, and it was a bless, uh, a blessing for me indeed for not being allowed to go there. Thank you. To finish, I'm going to be asking you more gen general questions. When you were in Phnom Penh, you were told that you would return to Phnom Penh three to four days later. And later on, were you told why you would not return to Phnom Penh? Okay, Atman. Response, uh, I was not told and I did not ask them or dare not ask them. Having noted anyone disappearing or uh, someone die, we uh, did not have, uh, we did not dare ask them for any question, we just worked and worked. When you left Phnom Penh, you were told it was because there was a risk that the US might start bombing. So you left your first home, and you were told that you would be taken to Batambang because there was a lot of rice there, and that isn't, in fact, where you went. You told us that the Khmer Rouge invented these excuses to take you to places, and they weren't particularly interested in keeping their word. But in your view, what was the real reason for all of these movements? I thought that the evacuation of the people from one place to another is to temper them. Because if they really told us that we had to relocate, then we would feel very uncomfortable that we had to leave our belongings behind. For that reason, they would tell us that we would leave only for three days. But we left for more than that, and then we had no hope that we would return. And for that reason, we tried to temper ourselves, to adhere ourselves to the Onkar's lines. And as a result, 10 of my family members died, and only two remained. So you lived through the evacuation of Phnom Penh and the first forced transfer. In the first place, you lived in the conditions that you described, and then there was another forced transfer. There's another place, and you described the conditions of that to us as well. You've told us about the re-education center. From the experiences that you lived through, would you say that the evacuation of Phnom Penh and the forced transfer all belonged to a broader plan or policy by the Khmer Rouge? I made my own analysis and I came to a conclusion that was truly the policy of the Khmer Rouge. They did not value a human being as well as their lines and their anka would progress forward. They don't care about the lives of people. Of course, they had plenty of medicines and rice, but they did not provide those to the people. For us, as long as we could live together with our families, we would uh, do our best uh, in doing the work. I tried to transform myself, and I could even compete with the best people in transplanting rice, but they did not value us. Their intention was to eradicate us so that newborn people would have new ideas based on their, their thinking and the way they act during the time.
Thank you very much, Madam. I have no further questions to ask you, and in a more general way, I would like to thank you for having made this rather difficult statement, which has given us some particularly useful elements for our file. Thank you, Madam, and thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. The floor is now given to the prosecution. You may proceed. Bonjour. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, Your Honours. Uh, good morning to all parties uh, and to uh, the gallery and to all of you um, and to you, witness. Uh, we are going to put a few follow-up questions to you, not many, but I believe uh, this will take us to the morning break, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I simply would like to clarify a few things with you starting from 17 April 1975. And in order to uh, understand things better, can you give us the name of your first husband? I don't think you um, gave us this name. So your husband, who was an officer who uh, was in the London Army and who later on was executed. My husband's name was Pratt Sinat. He was born in... 1948 in Bosat province. Merci. Thank you. So if I understood clearly what you said to us yesterday, you told us that your husband Praxinat did not take part in uh, the battle against the Khmer Rouge in Phnom Penh. So aside from that, did you see or hear on 17 April 1975 fighting uh, happening in Phnom Penh. I did uh, not know about that. What I knew was that the Khmer Rouge arrived in Phnom Penh and the shelling stopped. And we were jubilant and congratulate, congratulated the victory of 17 April 1975 and that we would have peace. Indeed, you said yesterday uh, that uh, you stepped out into the street uh, to congratulate uh, the victors uh, and to wave flags. So, although you were delighted that the war was over, were you afraid because of uh, your husband's military past? I was afraid because I heard that those people, during the time that the people were gathered to be soldiers and that they would empower people and take out the levers. So when I saw them dressing in black uniforms, I was uh, afraid. Thank you. And you told us that people gathered in the streets and they were singing and applauding. So from the point of view of the Khmer Rouge, how did the Khmer Rouge react uh, when they saw these crowds? Did they celebrate their victory with uh, the crowds or were they more reserved or, or did they behave in a different way? They were attentive and vigilant. We, although we, when we raised our hand to congratulate them, they raised their hand back. But they were in an attentive manner, and they were vigilant. Thank you. Yesterday you told us that uh, the messages you were hearing for the Khmer Rouge uh, were broadcast uh, by radio. Can you tell us if the Khmer Rouge used the loudspeakers uh, when you were in the street or when you returned home to give their first instructions to the population? I 
I heard once when I was at my house, but while we were en route, we did not hear, hear it. There was no announcement from loudspeakers en route. We only heard the shouting that we had to leave immediately. Thank you. And you said regarding this that one soldier, then two other soldiers came to your home and ordered you to leave the city immediately. Following this, did you decide to leave the city right away or did you take a bit of time to gather your belongings? Or were the Khmer Rouge waiting for you uh, before your home to make sure that you would be leaving? At that time, I actually had prepared my belonging already due to the uh, shellings in the previous days. And in the morning, we already cooked our rice. And we, we had just to, to prepare the, the food for ourselves. And at the time that the soldiers came to our house, they were quite animated. And then my husband and my relatives decided that we had to leave. If we did not go, we were afraid that we would be shot. Thank you. So these soldiers who told you to leave, did they tell you that you would be leaving for three days or for a full week? You said both yesterday. So during your first contact with the Khmer Rouge on 17 April, did they tell you that you would be leaving for three days or for seven days? Initially, we were told that uh, we would leave only for three days or the longest uh, seven days and that we did not ha have to bring uh, much belongings. And I thought the same thing that how could uh, we go to the countryside without having sufficient uh, belongings? So I believed them. I believed that uh, we would only leave for three days and the long case of seven days. So everybody then uh, just left. You told us that you had to travel to the countryside and did they tell you exactly where you had to go then or all this was not clear? No, they did not tell us specifically as where we had to go. What we were told was that we had to leave Phnom Penh and when we reached uh, Monibung Boulevard near the Royal School of uh, Law, it was so crowded. But at the Kbaknol Junction, there were various roads leading through various other directions, and the, the road became less uh, crowded. But they did not tell us to specific directions that we had uh, to follow. And when they came to your home, these three Khmer Rouge soldiers, did they tell you that, they w that the people would be given vehicles to uh, facilitate uh, the evacuation? No, they did not. They simply told us to leave by whatever means we had. So they told you not to take much with you, but did they tell you to take enough food or, or, or enough uh, medicine or enough um, sleeping materials for a three to seven day trip? No, they did not tell us to bring this or that belonging. It's uh, up to us to bring along the things that we use on a daily basis. But 
for my family, I did not bring rice uh, with us because rice was heavy, and I only brought uh, some real currency because I believed that the money could be used along the way. But of course, the Khmer Rouge didn't tell you that it was completely useless uh, to bring currency with you. That's what I understood yesterday. No, they did not. And while we were en route, we heard about that. So we, were, we became so hopeless that the money was no longer used. Thank you. You spoke about the excuse of the American bombings, and I'd like to return to this point. When the Khmer Rouge arrived at your home, or when you saw other Khmer Rouge soldiers along the road in Phnom Penh and later on, did they come up with other excuses than the American bombings to uh, justify this evacuation, to convince the people to leave Phnom Penh quickly? Uh, and without any problems. No, they did not uh, tell anything besides that uh, the Americans would bomb the city. And of course, we were afraid of the bombardment, so we also tried to rush ourselves to leave the city. Thank you. You also told us that the Khmer Rouge who came to your home were armed and you were frightened. And was their attitude threatening? Was, did they seem threatening to you? At that time, they did not threaten me. Actually, I was on the upper floor and my husband went downstairs to meet with them. They had their guns and they were quite animated, and by seeing them having guns, we were already afraid. You told us yesterday that uh, the order to leave the city was firm, and the Khmer Rouge were determined. And the way the order was given, and the Khmer Rouge attitude did they lead you to believe that you had free choice and that you could stay at home or that you could choose to leave instead? No, uh, I did not think like that at that time. We had to go because we were so afraid of the American area bombardment because we saw the damages from the uh, shelling previously, so we had to leave. Did you see along the road when you left Phnom Penh, in the different quarters that uh, you traveled through, did you hear that certain people, however, tried to discuss the orders with the Khmer Rouge, the orders to leave the city? No, I did not uh, witness that personally, but my family members uh, saw that. They said that we had to just proceed ahead, and if we return, then we would be killed. And of course, I heard the uh, gunshots. In the city of Phnom Penh, when you were leaving Phnom Penh, did you see Khmer Rouge shoot in the air or threaten people to force them to leave the city quicker, for example? Yes, I did see that. I was threatened while en route, 
At that time, I had a green color carry bag, and I had some essential belongings, including uh, money, and I carried it uh, with me while I was uh, sitting on the truck. It seems that the Khmer Rouge soldiers, really, despite the, the Khmer the, the soldiers, and when they saw that uh, green bag, they pointed a gun at me and asked me to throw away the bag. I was second and terrified. So I pour out my belongings and place it on a piece of a scarf and I threw away that bag immediately. And if I didn't do that, I would have been shot. They really threatened me at the time to get rid of that bag. I would like you to clarify what you said yesterday regarding the Lon Nol soldiers who were in uniform. You told us that you saw certain things and that other people had told you that the Lon Nol soldier had been arrested and that their hands had been tied behind their backs. Can you tell us or clearly what you and your husband saw or what other people told you about this? At that time, I did not see it, but my husband and family members saw them being arrested. So, from that point, from that point of view, we could see that they were really enemies. That is, the Khmer Rouge soldiers and the Lonel soldiers. If they notice the ankles had the match of wear of wearing boots then they would be conclude that they were the soldiers and they would be arrested. Yesterday you provided us with an example of a colonel who was a member of your, who was one of your in-laws who had been identified as a soldier at a checkpoint and who, and therefore he was forced to return to Phnom Penh to work there. So, d did you learn later on what happened to this colonel uh, f who was one of your in-laws once he uh, returned to Phnom Penh? At that time, the Khmer Rouge did not know that my elder in-law was a colonel. When he left Phnom Penh, he went to stay at the Prey Ain. At that time, there was an announcement on the speaker that for any military officers, they should return to Phnom Penh to resume their work. Of course, as a human being, we would have an ambition, and we did not want to stay in the open. So upon hearing such an announcement, he prepared his belonging and returned to Phnom Penh. However, since the day he left, he disappeared. So we conclude that he was killed by the Khmer Rouge. Thank you. Yesterday as well, you told us that uh, when you left Phnom Penh, in your area or in the neighboring areas you saw bodies or at least your husband had seen bodies in the streets were these bodies the bodies of civilians or were they uh, soldiers the bodies that I saw at Prej Pra commune were in civilian clothes. And I saw young children uh, bodies in the hammocks. So they were simply civilians. I did not know for what reason that they were killed. Did you see other bodies before you arrived at Prej Pra commune in Phnom Penh? itself. Uh, uh, on
on the way, I saw one or two dead bodies. And by seeing dead bodies, I was afraid that if we did not follow their instructions, then we would be killed by the Khmerus. And we were very afraid upon seeing those dead bodies. So these one or two bodies you saw, were these the bodies of soldiers or were uh, the uh, bodies wearing civilian clothes? They were in uh, civilian clothes. Yesterday you said to us that there were several checkpoints along the way, and particularly the one of Chertal, and you told us that you could no longer move ahead nor move back from there. Can you tell us if uh, you were checked at other checkpoints along the way by Khmer Rouge uh, soldiers? At uh, those uh, checkpoints where we were not allowed to proceed further and that uh, we uh, were not allowed to cross uh, the checkpoint. We tried to escape from that place so that we could reunite with my uh, parents in Ksat Kondal district of Kondal province. So at the different checkpoints, do you see uh, the Khmer Rouge confiscate uh, belongings uh, from the evacuees. No, I did not see them confiscate anything. We could carry our belonging, uh, accept anything belonging uh, through uh, soldiers or military. Then they would uh, point guns to those people and they would get rid of those military staff. You made a distinction between 17 April people and the base people. So, as of when uh, did you hear this mention of uh, 17 April people? Was it already uh, when you were traveling to your village, or was it later? Since I reach a Swai Pratil village in Sang district and I stayed there for uh, two weeks and I contacted with the local people there and they referred to themselves as the best people and that we were called the 17 April people who were just evacuated from Phnom Penh. Thank you. Now I would like to turn to uh, your departure from Sak Kandal when the village chief told you to prepare your belongings to leave uh, to what he said would be Batambang. And uh, when this village chief named Pat asked you to prepare your belongings, was this an order or could you discuss uh, this uh, decision? It was an order, and also we thought that if we go to Badambong, it would be better because uh, in Cambodia everyone was uh, very well aware that Badambong was a rich province, so we did not have even a slight idea of a protest against going to Badambong. And during the evacuation of Phnom Penh, when you were told that you would be leaving for three to seven days, and in the end, you were already in Sakandal for a year at, or at least, and you were not allowed to return home. And when the village chief told you that you would be going to 
Plattenbong, did you doubt what he was saying? Did you have any questions about the truthfulness of what he was telling you? At that time, I did not have any suspicion because at the second day, the commune, the commune chief told us that we should go because uh, then the food was uh, plentiful there. And at that location, there was n not uh, enough food and there were too many people. So new families uh, could not be uh, supported. And for that reason, we should leave. Thank you. I have a last question, which in fact is a request for clarification. And you told us that all of the people who left Ksak Kandal to Prasat, therefore who were taken away by different vehicles, were evacuees, or in any case, uh, 17 April people. And you told us that there were about 200 people. and. Did most of these people stay in the cooperatives in Porsat, or did some of them uh, keep on going uh, with their journey to Batambang? I did not know much about that because I only knew that when we reached the Kochum Cooperative, that's all I knew. Merci. Thank you. And last question. When you arrived at the cooperative, were you questioned about your past? Were you obliged uh, to draft a biography? No, they did not uh, question us, but we were put into various uh, groups and units. And we were asked what we did in Phnom Penh or what business we were engaged in, but we were not asked to write a biography. And there again, as you had done before, did you say that your husband uh, had been a cab driver? Yes, I uh, told them that my husband was a Lambretta driver. Merci beaucoup, Madame. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Civil Party. Um, I believe my colleague might have a few questions to put to you uh, before uh, the morning break. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. President, Jonas. Good morning, Madam Civil Party. I only have a few supplementary questions uh, to put to you. I want to know that when people were evacuated from Phnom Penh, Was there any family or anyone who requires not to leave Phnom Penh? Did they have such a choice of not leaving Phnom Penh? Response. I did not know about that at that time because I did not think about other people. I was busy thinking about my family members. So I did not know whether any family requested uh, not to leave Phnom Penh. Question. When there were arrests of people or the former lunar soldiers, were business uh, people arrested too? Was, uh, were the arrests uh, conducted in general for everyone? Response. As far as I knew, all lunar soldiers would be arrested if they were suspicious of being lunar soldiers.
question. What about ordinary civilians or business people? Were they also arrested? Response. Let me uh, speak a little bit on this matter. As for the ordinary civilians, while I was at the tempering office, I learned that not only soldiers had been arrested, but civilians were also arrested as they were alleged of being capitalists or feudalists or those who sold goals at the market in Phnom Penh. So while I was in that office, I learned that from all walks of life, people had been arrested. <coughs> Question. Before the commencement of the evacuation of people from Phnom Penh, was there an announcement on the radio, or was there any word from mouth to mouth regarding the planned evacuation? Response. No, I did not learn in advance that there would be an evacuation, but they came to us uh, promptly, and that we had to leave uh, in the wake of the American bombardment. Question. During the period that you stayed at the location where you had been evacuated to, there were criticism meetings, as you said. What was the intention of such a meeting, and who actually led that meeting? Response. The criticism meeting was led by the group and the deputy, the group chief and deputy group chief. The purpose was for people to criticize anyone who was a member of the group who made a mistake. Best people will be able to deny or to protest any criticism, but for us, the 17 every people, we kept silent and just tried to commit ourselves to refashion ourselves and try to not make mistake again. Question. When you and other people who had to sell on car and then fell ill, how were you treated when you got sick? Response. If we got ill, for example, practically, if it was obvious that we got diarrhea or vomiting and people saw this, then we could have a rest. But uh, we couldn't afford to be sick because other would say that uh, we pretended to be sick and they would look us in a they will give a strange look at us when we did so. Question. What did you do? Uh, what did people do in the cooperatives? Response. At cooperatives. During dry season, we would be asked to dig canal to keep water for irrigation for, for paddy fields. And during the rainy season and the farming season in particular, we were asked to transplant rice, to build the dikes, and so on and so forth. Caution. Could you also tell the chamber, please, concerning the correction center or the security center where your husband was detained? For example, the Takaul correction center or other center. What kind of torture was uh, being inflicted on the prisoners there? The President, uh, Civil Party, could you please hold on counsel for Mr. Ian Sari? You on your feet. You will, may not proceed. Counsel, Ang Odam. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Your Honours. Very good morning to my learned colleagues. 
I take issue with this question because it relates to the security centers. These security centers uh, are not relevant to document E124. Co-prosecutor, Mr. President, this morning, the civil party testified about the security center and the place where her husband was detained and tortured. I would just like to ask her the techniques of torturing, and I would like to know more about how her husband was uh, treated uh, under detention. I would like her to answer to this question. The President, uh, the objection is well reasoned and therefore sustained. The National Court Prosecutor is not allowed to put questions that straying out of the scope of the facts being at issue here. We are now focusing on the immediate evacuations of uh, Phnom Penh and the city, so the questions shall always be framed to go straight to these particular areas. The civil party is somehow entitled with the right uh, to express her suffering in the scope of case file 002 slash 01 and after such expression of suffering parties will be offered the opportunity to address uh, a few points if they wish so please do not uh, dwell on the same problem question since uh, we are running out of time I would like to ask uh, just a few final questions you talked about the hardship the difficulties you encountered during the evacuation can you please describe to the chamber all these uh, hardships were they different response I had a lot of difficulties I endured uh, hardship I used to be raised in Phnom Penh I never got used to hard labor I had just delivered my baby for a few days and when I was evacuated I had to be separated from separated from my family members and again, after giving a baby, my health was not good. Uh, and I could see other people had to give birth uh, midway. Some people had to be pushed uh, uh, on a hospital bed because they were seriously sick. And I could see elderly people who had to be walking. Uh, without proper destination. So everyone who left uh, the city had a lot of difficulties and these difficulties were also shared uh, by the people at the local area. The prosecutor, thank you very much, uh, Civil Party, for your responses and I thank you, Mr. President, and your honors for this opportunity. The President, thank you, Council, and thank you, Civil Party. It is now appropriate time for adjournment. Uh, the Chamber will adjourn, and the uh, Court Officer is now instructed to assist the Civil Party during the adjournment and uh, have her return by 11 a.m.